what is probate? What is it anyway, right? It's like math. People have heard the term, we don't like it, it makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> we know that it's a long process and that it's something that we don't know about, attorneys are involved and it's costly, right? That's like never a good mix of information, right? That's like the perfect storm of cringe. So um, in a nutshell, we'll go through probate. Why do people not like probate? It's a court supervised process. Anything court supervised in California sucks, okay? Especially right now. And I really hate to use the like the COVID excuse because um, I feel like everybody uses that for everything. Um, however, it's really true, right? It really, the court staff, a lot of them in Orange County have been let go. So they're working with an understaffed court. Um, we have been told not even to come to the courthouse. We're, we're still making our appearances via Zoom because they don't have the bailiffs to, as they said, keep us safe, which is a little alarming. Um, so we just call it in on Zoom. We phone, it, we phone it in. But the processing times are really down. So let's kind of walk through that timeline. Somebody passes away, you file the petition, right? You get the, the court date. The court date is going to be, depending on the county, um, maybe about four months out, four to five months out, okay? So from the time you, the attorney initially files the petition, four to five months out, you have the first hearing. In that interim, you have to uh, publish the notifications okay, of death. Um, and basically, you just have to sit around and wait and wait, and then you wait some more. This is the most crucial time because your client, the potential client for you guys, cannot sign a listing agreement until they have what's called letters. And if you guys look at your packet, that is going to be the first form that you see. So those who are currently in a probate, perhaps with me, hint, hint, <laughs> this is the letter that you're, this is the document that we're waiting for, okay? So this is called letters. It's a funky little term, but it's called either letters, testamentary is a term that you're gonna hear a lot, or letters of administration. Letters testamentary is when somebody passes away with a will, okay? Letters of administration is when somebody passes away without a will. So if your client comes to you trying to sell the real property of a deceased family member, they cannot sign a listing agreement until this document has been signed by the court. Okay? It's called letters. It says DE-150. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So this is going to be the document that gives your client that authority. Back to the timeline, again, once it's filed, you have a hearing, okay? The attorney shows up to the hearing in Zoom um, and it's approved. Once it's approved, you would think that it would be very easy for the court to just stamp this document. Not so much, okay? <laughs> I have waited up to 12 weeks for this document to be processed in Orange County, okay? Um, so the question was, um, do you have to find an executor before you can open a probate and do they have to have good credit? And the answer is yes to both. Take the first one. Do you have to find an executor first? Yes. Most of the time, the people coming to you would likely be the executor or the administrator, right? Because they would be coming to you saying, hey, my aunt just died or my dad just died. Somebody's passed away and I need to sell this real property they will more than likely be the ones that are seeking to be appointed, right? But that's a great question. Uh, the question is, if the person seeking to be appointed, uh, do they have to be in California or can they be out of state? They can be out of state. They will just have to post a bond. So to your earlier question, she had asked, does the person need to have good credit? And the answer is yes, they have to be bondable, okay? Um, to fully answer that question really quickly, they have to be bondable. Um, unless all of the heirs waive the bond. All of the heirs can waive the bond and then the bond does not need to, the administrator rather, does not need to post a bond. The asterisk here is unless they're out of state. If they live out of state, the only way for the court to get jurisdiction over them is to force them to post a bond and that's how the heirs are protected. Okay, so, so yes, they have to be able to post a bond if they're out of state. The question was why the bond? So the bond is to protect the beneficiaries um, if there are multiple beneficiaries, say mom and dad have passed away and there's four kids, there's nothing really to stop 
uh, I don't know, administrator from, you know, selling the house and going to Pechanga and putting it on black. Um, so that bond will pay out for any malfeasance of either the administrator or the executor to protect the beneficiary. It's like a contractor's bond, right? Just make sure the work gets done, make sure it gets done timely. Yeah. Uh, do you need a bond only for a probate or do you have to have a bond for a trust also? By statute, you have to have a bond for a probate unless it's waived. For a trust, it depends upon the document. So I'll just touch on this, we'll touch on it later as well. But in a trust, a trust is a private document, okay? So all of the assets will pass from one person that's passed to the beneficiaries without court administration. Um, the terms of that contract will govern if the person has to post a bond. I also do estate planning. I always say that the administrator, rather that the trustee does not have to post a bond, but it depends on the scenario, right? If it's a neighbor um, and the person's afraid that maybe, you know, they wanna make sure their kids are protected, maybe my client will ask that a bond be put in there, but it really depends on the person making the trust. That's a great question. Other questions on bonds? Okay, so at that point, um, we are kind of journeying back to where we started from regarding letters which is a great question about bond because the letters will not issue until a bond has been posted. So that also adds to time, right? The person has to qualify. The company that I work with, I mean, they're super great, super efficient. Um, it's typically that part is a pretty quick process, but anything that is going through the court system, not so much, okay? So once you have the hearing, the letters can issue anywhere up between three weeks to like I said, the most I've seen is 12 weeks. And once they have that in their hand, then you're good to go to sign the listing agreement. Yeah. The question was, what does the bond run as far as cost? It's a percentage of the estate. Okay, so whatever amount is in the estate. Um, if it's around, I could tell you, what was my last one? If it was around 600,000 for total assets, the bond is a couple thousand dollars. And it's not refundable, but it is payable by the estate. Okay. So your client, and I'll, I'll run through this because this is all good questions um, that your clients will likely ask you because if you look at it from their perspective, they're thinking, how does this affect me? How much do I have to pay? Am I gonna get reimbursed? So the bond premium can be paid by the estate if there's cash in the estate. A lot of the times the situations you guys will find yourself is it's just real estate, right? It's cash poor, right? Um, but it has a nice piece of dirt that can be sold for a nice chunk of change. Um, but if there is cash, then that cash can be used to pay the bond premium. If there is no cash, the administrator will front the costs um, and then they'll get paid back at the conclusion of the probate. Okay. Other questions on that? I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. What if no one that's trying to be executor is bonded? Does, there, does the court appoint someone randomly? Yeah, the court will appoint someone. There is a list. But it's not published because a lot of us have tried to find it to like pick who we wanted. <laughs> um, it's not published, but there is a list that that um, somebody can either be court appointed or there's a a, a county uh, somebody from the county that does it. They have a they have a section that does that. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, she had a case where there was two angry people arguing. Somebody was trustee. The court appointed a neutral person to act. Is what it sounds like. Um, welcome to my day. <laughs> That's most of my cases. Um, and yes, that does happen. That does not make it a probate. She specifically said it was a trust. So if the court has said, listen, Bob and Sally, you guys can't figure it out and put your big boy and girl pants on, we're gonna get Jim over here to do it, okay? So they bring in a neutral because the court doesn't, court and it had to be court approved. Court appointed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, court appointed, court approved, same same concept. And that's at that point, the court has just said, you all are being toddlers. We're going to step in and handle this. Please go sit down. We don't want to, we, we don't want to deal with this anymore. So it doesn't make it a probate, but that can happen in a trust context as well. Did I see another hand? Yeah. The, the question was, doesn't the trust usually dictate who gets what, but can the court still intervene? Yes. So the trust, again, it's a private document. The terms of the trust are what govern unless nobody can agree and then there is the court forum to go in and say all right bob and sally nobody's getting along we can't keep clogging up the court system with this because we can't get our stuff together so um, they appoint somebody that's that's the forum and jurisdiction to go in and do that sure yeah. the question was was it appealable sorry uh, is it appealable if the court does that um, yes depending upon the type of order only certain orders are appealable 
but 95% of the time it's agreed to or stipulated to by the parties because everybody's paying attorney's fees, right? Or it's coming out of the trust and you know, you're just kind of dwindling the coffers at that point. So the attorneys get together with Bob and Sally and say, you're being ridiculous. <laughs> if you guys can't get along and we're just gonna keep kind of chomping away at this, then they would have the court agree on somebody to have the court appoint at that point. Yeah. So in California, the threshold is super low for what goes through probate. And it was about 150,000. And now I think, what did I put here that it's at? Yeah, 184.5, okay? And that changes every year for inflation, but you know, just really incrementally. Um, how many of you here in Orange County have sold a home for under 184,000? No, oh really, in Orange County? Laguna Woods. Laguna Woods, okay, all right, that's true. Fair enough, fair enough, I was wrong. But most of the time, right, your clients are gonna be coming in is obviously gonna be over $184,000. So it's a very low bar for you to have to go through probate. As I said, the um, time frame is egregious. Um, it's very costly. The fees are set by statute and the administrator, the person that was appointed to administer the estate, gets the same percentage as the attorney. It's like 4% of the first 100,000, 3% of the next 100,000, 2% of the next 800, and then 1% I think of the next million, right? So um, administrator fees and attorney's fees typically run um, anywhere between like 50 to $75,000 combined. Half of that for the attorney, half of that for the administrator. So it's very costly. It becomes public record. So all of the debts, you know, go through the court system. Every, what the assets are go through the court system. Everything becomes public record. You open it up for creditors, right? This gets published, creditors find you. Um, then that becomes kind of a free for all and that really kicks the can on how long this is going to take because you have to deal with the creditors before you can close it out. Um, you have to give an accounting and everything has to be court approved. So when your clients are coming into you, they're very frustrated. It's not a great scenario. They've lost a loved one. And then you have to counsel them like, this is gonna take a while, right? Go ahead. Uh, I may be jumping ahead. Go for it. What if the estate does not have enough value in it to account for attorney's fees, uh, the administrator fees, and all the debts that are owned? Sure. Um, there is a right of priority, so it's um, like, they have to repay the administrator for a burial and last rites and last medical expenses and things like that. That gets repaid first. Um, then cost of administration, such as the administrator fees and the attorney's fees, and the creditors are down after that. Um, but basically you'd strike a deal and it gets apportioned. Um, for attorneys, I mean, I mean, truthfully, if there's no cash in the estate, I've had people come to me and if there's no cash in the estate and there's real property, but person doesn't wanna sell, then, I mean, there's no, there's no way to pay for administrative expenses. So from a practical standpoint, I don't know that an attorney would take that one. You know, the person can do it by themselves. But the answer to the question of what do you do if there's not enough funds there, um, you just kind of start divvying up the pie and, and either agree to it or not. <laughs> That's the way it works. Other questions about that? Okay. Um, so the last reason why it becomes very, very difficult is the assets are frozen, right? Until you get this court order. You guys will be involved up until the letters have issued, okay? Once the letters have issued, you can list the property, the, uh, the funds get uh, transferred via wire into an estate account, and there they sit, okay? You cannot distribute them until there is a court order, or rather the uh, administrator or the executor cannot distribute them until there's a court order. Um, but after that, those funds sit there and they can't be distributed. So if there's a mortgage, uh, that mortgage has to be paid, whether it be an investor or the family comes up with it or it's gotta be paid somehow or it gets lost to foreclosure, right? Um, so it's not a great process. It's very, very frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, if everything is getting paid, it's a great question. The question, so everybody was on the same page, is if, listen, if this pie is getting split up, right, and creditors and everybody has to maybe take a lesser share, where does your guys' commission fall in all of that? And that gets paid directly out of escrow. That does not have to be frozen until the end of the administration. So you guys are good. It's like the attorneys and everybody else. We have to fight over it. <laughs> you guys are golden. Um, which is a great point, is that, you guys can get your, your commissions, everything gets paid out of escrow, but it gets, every, again, everything gets frozen in an estate account. 
Um, why I love kind of doing these kinds of talks and working with you guys is it really helps the attorneys for just the information to be out there about the process. Because again, it's a little bit like, I don't know, like high school calculus and nobody gets what's happening, or at least I did not. Um, and the more you like, the more you know, right? Um, the easier the process will be. Because one time, we had a check arrive from escrow for the attorney's fees, which is like a disbarable offense. You cannot have your attorney's fees paid before the court actually approves that petition to close the estate. So, like it was like hot potato, like send it back, send it back, send it back. So, um, it's really good that again everybody's on the same page and and can can work together. Uh, questions about that stuff? Nope. One last note on there is what triggers a probate. And again, that's the value that we discussed, but it's if somebody dies with just their name on title alone, and it's not in a trust, that is what that triggers a probate. If it's in Sue Smith's name individually as an unmarried person, probate. Okay. If it's anybody's name as the trustee of a revocable trust, no probate, you guys are good. Yeah. That probably happens a lot, especially if someone refies and then their name is taken out of the trust. Oh, huge, huge. In that scenario, not to like go too deep into the weeds, but there is a workaround. If the trust was drafted properly and you can show that there is clear and convincing evidence that there is intent for Sue Smith to have put it in the trust, it's still a court process, don't get me wrong, but it's not a full probate and it's not as costly. Like just for... Um, reference yeah for reference like for those types of petitions it's one petition it's likely not going to be contested I would take a retainer of 2500 and that's probably about what it would cost it wouldn't go over by much um, for that type of matter and to repeat the question back for you guys it was what if you refi and it had been in a trust um, and then the property got pulled out and is in their name alone like then what there's a truncated process that's not the full probate to go ahead and do that okay other questions Okay, moving right along. Okay, this is the, what we had kind of gone over here was the, the expenses here. Um, just for the timeline, as you can see, it takes at least three hearings. Again, it becomes public record, and then you'll see in caps at the bottom there what uh, she was describing as fighting among family members, right? Um, this really opens the door for, I don't want Bob to be the administrator, I want Sally to do it because Sally took my Barbie when she was 16 and, and like we all chuckle but that's like that's a real conversation I had to have one time. <laughs> um, so it really can get very ugly very very quickly so just best to avoid it if at all possible. Um, and again kind of back to this timeline of letters will issue Da, 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 eventually okay so that's your guys's golden ticket and I printed that form out for you guys so you have it to reference so a little bit more about the letters um, there are a few things that you guys as realtors need to know about letters right not just what it looks like or what it's for but just kind of varying types because again this talk is to make sure that you guys get some value out of it so you know how to move smoothly through that process and to kind of get that that listing right um, so there's two types. You can either have independent authority and full authority or limited authority. And a lot of popular questions I get is, does the court need to actually approve this sale? And sometimes, yes. If your client only has partial authority or limited authority, then they have to have it court approved before they can take any action, okay? Um, if they do have full authority, no court needs to approve the process they have to appoint your client, but they do not need to approve the sale. So nobody has to go down there and do like an overbid and nothing like that, okay? So, so long as your client, that's the ticket for you guys, so long as your client has full authority, you guys are gonna be good to go um, as far as listing. Yeah, question. So the question was, at least, a, should you have at least a 45 day escrow so that notices can go out? We'll get to that. Um, it's called notice of proposed action. Um, and I did include that for you guys in your packet. So let's just tackle it now. Um, it is the, th should be the third form, the notice of proposed action, okay? Statutorily, your guys' clients as administrators or executors need to give 15 days notice to all of the heirs. Okay, it's up in the top left, uh, right-hand corner, it says DE-165, Notice of Proposed Action. This has to go out to all of the heirs with at least 15, day 15 days, if I could talk, 
mail served notice, okay? So if you have less than a 15 day escrow, all of the heirs can waive the notice. But as an example, I just uh, closed a probate up in LA County, um, very, very large family, lady passed, not having been married, no children. Um, so it went to all her nieces and nephews, but they were all deceased. So it went to their kids and they each had like six or seven kids and she had like 11 nieces and nephews. So it was in, like, I kept the post office very busy. <laughs> so I could not get waivers from all of these people, right? So I had to send out the notice. A um, realtor called me who was doing the listing and said, which is not my first choice, but <laughs> they had called me and said, okay, we got an all cash offer. We're good to go in three days. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> you're for sure not. <laughs> Why don't we just press pause and let's send out this form. And they said, well, you can just, they knew enough, right? Like you can just have everybody wave it. And I was like, sure. Do you want to go around to all of these people and have them wave it? I cannot do that, but let's just push it out. So it has to be at least 15 days. If it's less, and let's say there's just two people, um, you can have, you know, or a manageable amount of heirs, you can just have this waived, okay? This doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't need to go out every single time. So uh, minimum of 15 days, unless you can get a waiver, then your escrow can be longer, okay? And this is mandatory. Um, you're, you're, you, the <laughs> client, the attorney, everybody, would not be having a very good day um, if this did not go out. So also escrow wouldn't close <laughs> um, unless uh, the process would not would be would be put on hold. Basically, if you got all the way through and then escrow says, OK, send me over the notice and or the waivers. And then everybody just kind of stares blankly at each other. So I have really tried to prepare a checklist for you guys. You don't have to remember these, but just if you have a type of probate listing, you know enough to sit down and say, you know, kind of circle the wagons and get your ducks in a row to know, you know, what do I have to at least have top of mind to look out for, okay? Uh, questions about that notice? Nope, okay. Uh, so that is that on there. So full authority or limited authority. Uh, full authority is obviously better, but again, um, you guys do not need to have this court approved if your client has full authority. Um, and again, once I email this out to you guys so that you can see it, you know, not in such a condensed form, I've made a little timeline here for you guys. So this is just really to kind of give you guys and to help your clients just get an expectation of what's happening because the first part is always the most frustrating, right? They're wanting to list it. The market's going south. They want to list it at the top of the market, but they don't have the authority to list it. So they are getting very, very frustrated very difficult from an attorney's perspective as well because I cannot control the court system as much as I would love to um, and the clerks don't take your calls. <laughs> um, most of the time now the departments don't even have an outgoing voicemail it just beeps. Um, so there's you just leave a voicemail in the oblivion and call it a day and just hope for the best. Um, but this is that timeline for you guys so from the first steps of filing the probate petition then again, you're about eight to 10 weeks out from a hearing. That's a really positive time frame if you can get that hearing in eight to 10 weeks, okay? Once, again, your client has been approved and appointed at that hearing, an order will have to issue, which is I have also included in here for you guys, right before the notice of proposed, maybe it's the first one. Yeah, right before the notice of proposed action, it says order for probate. This has to issue after the first hearing. The court has to stamp this, enter the order saying they have been approved. If you look on there, it says, warning, this appointment is not effective until letters have issued, okay? So the sequence of events, the order has to be issued, which has to be processed by a court. And what did we learn about that? It takes a very long time. Once you get this order, then the letters can start to be processed. And again, that's you know a, a bit of a long time frame. So it can be very, very frustrating for your clients because they're chomping at the bit. They want this sold. Maybe they're fronting the fees and costs for the mortgage and the property taxes and all these kinds of things. So um, I really encourage you guys to work with your attorney um, You know, that's working with your client so that everybody's on the same page. I know it's super easy uh, if, a client, <laughs> if a client asks a question, we're all guilty of this sometimes, right? You just, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a couple more days, a couple more weeks, you just, want to give them the answer so that everybody just kind of feels placated and um, 
really I would just kind of prepare them for the worst right out of the gate when it comes to getting their letters. Um, work with your attorney, they can keep you updated, and then your client doesn't get as frustrated if you let them know right out of the gate, like, it's gonna be a bit, okay? So that's, that's my spiel on that. Um, again, go ahead. Yeah. It take up to 20 weeks until you get the letters? Yes, yes. It takes a long time. From the time you file, file the petition. The petition. That's when you can get involved, and that's when they can sign your listing agreement. And then you do not have to, if they have full authority, you don't have to get court approval from that point in time. You can just list it, sell it, and then you, you know, you'd work with the attorney and you'd get the wire instructions to put it into the estate account. It gets frozen, you guys get paid, and you guys can kind of go on your, your merry way, and everybody's happy at that point. What was that? Yeah, next probate, next probate. And I truly, I mean, I really do mean this. I'm very happy to partner with you guys and answer questions. If I'm not the attorney on the matter, um, but you guys have come to this you know, talk today, I'm happy to field your questions and answer questions for you guys and just walk you through the process. If you're gonna have a meeting with a potential client and they're hoping to land a listing and are like, I think I remember enough to sound competent, give me a call, we'll, we'll run it through, okay? And I'll, I'll forward you guys this. Um, handout here today so that you can go through it. Um, how can I help my clients? Again, we've gone through much of this on your guys' questions, but just manage your clients' expectations again as far as the timeline is concerned. I think that's the key um, because they'll kind of go to you guys for a different advice than they're getting from the attorney and try to find a workaround, right? Um, like toddlers trying to divide and conquer their parents. Um, so really just client ex management of their expectations um, and communication. Um, one other thing I would just like to say, kind of going back to my example of us getting the random check for attorney's fees, if you don't know, just ask. <laughs> um, it does no harm to you guys and to myself if I don't know anything in your guys' realm. It's like, that's a realtor question. You know, let's go talk to whomever has done the listing for you. Um, but just say, I think the answer might be X, but let's go confirm with the attorney, right? And that way, again, everybody's on the same page um, and it can go a little bit smoother. How can it be avoided? So here we're kind of going to go into trust, powers of attorney, and a little bit about financial elder abuse, because these are all things that can expose you all to liability. Um, again, I do litigation as well. In the past with the firm that I was at, um, we've roped some realtors into um, a lawsuit as a defendant for financial elder abuse if something was a little bit shady, right? Like maybe the person was in a coma <laughs> and daughter came up and said, I have power of attorney and the realtor let her sign but never saw the power of attorney. So that's, that's what we like to call financial elder abuse. Um, so that can be really important for you guys. Um, before we move on to just kind of go through that, do you guys have any questions about probate or the timeline or anything we went through? Yeah. If there's two administrators that want to um, serve, sure. how does the court determine which is more qualified? Question is, if there's two administrators that want to serve, how does the court determine who's more qualified? Um, if they're fighting about it, there's a couple of different options. 90, again, in the 90s percentile, the court's going to appoint a neutral so that they don't fight. They can stipulate to be co-executors. That's something that can happen. Then they split the fee. Um, but if you think about it, if these people are already arguing, um, the judge is not really going to want them to be appointed co-executor because then every choice becomes a battle and then they're before the court on everything. So um, it gets creative. You can just, uh, it becomes a settlement agreement at that point. Yeah. So the timeline, I'm sure, in getting the hearing, yes. is this very different as Orange County? Yes. Where does Orange County stand in terms of where the sign is? So Orange County is more timely in getting you the hearing and less timely on processing. So the question was, uh, does it vary between counties and where does Orange County fall? Uh, it, it does vary Orange County. You can probably get a hearing within that eight week mark because there are some things that have to be done prior to that hearing um, to allow it to be approved. So you have to give the attorney and the client a bit of time. So you're about eight to 10 weeks out in Orange County. LA is longer for the first hearing, but they process it more efficiently. Um, you'll get your letters within a couple of weeks. Orange County, they'll get you in the door quicker, but then you're just in this weird limbo um, where everybody ignores your calls for a while. Riverside. Riverside is the most efficient because they have a lot of pro pers, which is somebody who represents themselves. 
Um, so they really get you in and out. So they're probably at, I'd say, about the six to eight week mark for a hearing. Um, and then I think probably about like a three to four week turnaround time for the letters, maybe even two sometimes. San Diego um, is much more like Orange County, it takes a lot longer. Yeah. Sorry, just no, you're good. The, the Orange County one. So like eight to 10 weeks for a hearing and then how long roughly for letters? I've had up to 12 weeks for letters um, and orders. So first you have to get the order and then the letters that's been, but I'd say probably about average, like probably another two months, like month and a half to two months is like the average, but then you have those outliers. Okay, other questions before we move on? Okay, um, how can probate be avoided? This is that um, revocable living trust that we were talking about. So if any of your clients own real estate, they should have their home in a trust. If they hold title to the property as trustee of their trust, it will just you know, go through to the beneficiaries without having to go through probate. I like to use the analogy, if you have, think of a big giant bowl, right, as a trust, all of the assets get put into this bowl, the trustee just passes the bowl off to the beneficiaries and there's no court oversight, no court involvement. Doesn't mean there's nobody's fighting about it, but there's no, no court process there, okay? Other ways that uh, if somebody passes away um, and they're on title with someone else as joint tenants, which I know you all see a lot, that will just pass automatically by operation of law, this legal myth, um, will go to the other person that's on title with them. An attorney might still need to be involved because something needs to be recorded in the chain of title to show that one of the joint tenants has passed and then you know the remainder is still alive and that is where title is vested. So that's another option. One thing that I really strongly, strongly discourage um, and really hope you discourage your clients from as well is um, putting their kids on title. Have you guys ever had this conversation with your clients? Like, I just put little Johnny on title, it's fine, I don't need to trust. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> because then it's also little Johnny's home, right? His liabilities become your client's liabilities. Um, a myriad of things are, are wrong with that scenario. Uh, maybe if it's an end of life issue and you know it's gonna pass quickly, sure, there are extenuating circumstances for everything, but just as a whole, I don't, I really strongly do not recommend that as an estate plan. Um, and it really does them a disservice as far as taxes go. So if you have a property um, and the basis in the property was $500,000 and you put little Johnny on title, their basis does not get stepped up to what the current market value is. So if when little Johnny, after mom passes away, goes to sell the property, but the property is now worth a million dollars, little Johnny has $500,000 of liability for capital gains taxes, okay? Whereas if little Johnny got his interest in a trust, then he gets the step up in basis, and then it's where he has the basis of a million dollars and no capital gains tax, right? So really, really try to discourage your clients if anybody comes to you to say that, just not, not a great idea, okay, yeah. So let's say there's no trust, uh, there's no trust, but there's a will, how would that work? Probate, <laughs> so, <laughs> that is a great question. The question, the question was, the question was, what if there's no trust and there's just a will? Probate, the probate court was set up to administer wills. And a lot of people think like, I did a will, I went on legal Zoom. I did my will myself um, and I don't have to go through probate, but that's, that's literally like the entry ticket into probate, for sure. If yes. the child is also married, yes, doesn't that create an issue with the spouse or the spouse of the kids' child? So the question, the question is, if mom and child are untitled together and the child is also married, doesn't that create an issue that that spouse maybe has a claim to the property? And it certainly could. Um, it certainly could. Gifts, things like that in California, not to get into like the community property weeds, but it would be separate property. Um, inheritance and gifts like that from parents would be considered separate property. Um, but it could certainly, to your point, open it up. Why even have to ask the question, right? It's very, very difficult. Yeah. So how can you set it up, let's say grandparents? Let's say my parents have, it's me and my yep. brother, but my parents want my son to inherit the house. So the trust, how would they set it up? Oh, so the question is, if grandparents want to pass to grandkids, how does that get set up? Without the kids 
without the inter the parents without the children getting in between right so we're going to pass over the offspring of the grandparents and go to the grandchildren very easily in a trust so just the grandparents would go to a trust attorney they would go through who they want the beneficiaries to be and then the uh, drafting attorney would just draft the trust such that it goes to the children the grandchildren if they're minors you can set up certain stages that it be distributed to them um, or if they're adults and you want it to get it outright it can go that way as well but it can certainly skip a generation it's called generation skipping trusts very aptly named um, very simple for an estate planning attorney to do uh, the question was how much would it cost so every estate planning attorney is different my personal pricing packages are for an entire estate plan it's two thousand seven hundred and fifty for a married couple and then just for an individual it's twenty five hundred and that would include the trust and all the other ancillary documents and the funding of the trust to somebody's point earlier how do you you know what if it's refied um, the estate plan includes the funding which again puts all of those assets in a bowl and passes it along yeah 2750 for a married couple. Yeah. What if Did you already have a trust that oh, hasn't looked at in 25 years? <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you're so in, if you're so inclined, send it over. I will look at it um, of no charge. Most attorneys should look at it for no charge and just look at it um, and then have a conversation with you of, hey, if you were to pass tomorrow, does this effectuate your goals? And if it does not, just make some tweaks. Yeah, certainly. The laws haven't changed such that it, it doesn't, the question is, if you already had a trust, um, should it be looked at again? And it doesn't make it invalid if it was drafted a long time ago, but just maybe your wishes have changed, right? Like my, I have twin girls who are four, and we, my husband and I set certain stages that they're going to inherit. And you know, the first is 25, but I don't know how they're going to be <laughs> with financial management. Um, so I might want to change that later on. Yeah. Yes. My other question is, let's say I own a house, I want my son to inherit it, so I have to create one trust for my home, and then my parents want my son to inherit their home, so they have to create a separate trust? That is correct. So that you would be called the settlor or the grantor, and your if you're, the question is, if the grandparents wanted to give a home and she wants to give a home, um, do they have to be two separate trusts? And the answer is yes, because you can only pass which property you own. So your your parents would not be able to pass your home to your child. Yeah. And each one are charged separately. So two thousand seven hundred for this. Or this Cor one. Correct. I mean, there could be if anybody has a scenario where there's multiple people in a family, then certainly fees could be negotiated in that way. Certainly. <laughs> certainly. Other. Yes. Go ahead. If you put a property in the trust that it's already in value, does that affect the tax base? The question is, if you put a piece of property in a trust and it's already increased in value, does that affect the tax base? No, because when you pass away, um, it will get stepped up to whatever the basis is on your date of death. Yeah, so it doesn't. But does it affect the tax base from the time you purchase it? No, the time you no, it still it stays static. And also, um, if you have transferred it into your trust, there should also be that preliminary change of ownership report that went with it to make sure like property taxes aren't reassessed and things like that. So. Uh, no, the short answer is it should not affect it in any way. Yeah. Yes. A death on transfer deed. Yes. Besides the tax problem mm -hmm. versus having a trust. Uh, the tax on transfer deed, I know that the legislature was looking at to phase out because there has been a lot. The question is the trust uh, transfer on death deed. Have you guys had exposure to this at all? There's a deed that somebody can draft that says, when I die, and it's not in a trust, it's in a deed form, give little Johnny my property, okay? Um, there has been like a fair amount of fraud <laughs> um, with those and a lot of litigation. Um, as it stands right now, like run of the mill, if somebody were to use it, it's absolutely fine. Um, there's not a tax issue with it. It's still exempt. The basis would be stepped up. Um, so that would be a good workaround if there were not other assets that needed to go into a trust. For sure, and while it's still around, <laughs> yes. So now, property taxes—they have really buckled down, um, and they passed a new law in I think 2019. Yeah. Um, so it, the property taxes might be reassessed. What I was answering was it, during your lifetime, when you, if you were to make a trust, would it go into your trust? 
um, when it goes into your trust rather, are the property taxes reassessed? That's no. But on your death, it might be. You can only pass to your, your that the person's gonna be using it as their primary residence, the beneficiary, and only up to a certain amount. So that's a different ball game at this point. Because there was a lot of very nice houses along the coastline that just were not reassessed for a very long time. <laughs> um, and the county got a little pissed off about it. So, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Back to the trust and the will. Yes. So if there's a will done, and this is more of an out of state question, uh -huh. there's a will done, but it's not a trust. Is, is that questionable, I guess? So if, there, if somebody lives in California, this is the question, I think. If somebody lives in California and they own property, oh, if they live out of state. So if somebody lives out of state and they own property out of state or in California? I wouldn't know, is the short answer. <laughs> if they live, so I know some, so I have a colleague of mine, he's from Minnesota, he had his own estate planning practice and um, their probate process was like a month. Um, and I'm like hanging out here for two years doing, an, doing a probate, so um, it really varies by state, uh, yeah. Um, okay, what is a durable power of attorney? Okay, how many of you have had to deal with uh, powers of attorney for financial management, bless you, in a transaction before? Anyone? Anyone? A couple people? Okay, so powers of attorney are a really serious document, right? It means that maybe son or daughter is stepping into mom and dad's shoes and can like sign on their bank account, every kind of financial transaction, right? Again, this is governed by a contract. It's governed by this durable power of attorney for financial management. Um, and the, the terms of it may vary. Um, for example, when I draft powers of attorney, I never, <laughs> never, never, never allow the person who's acting on behalf of the elder or the incapacitated person to create estate planning documents for them. You would be shocked at the amount of litigation I have over like moms in a coma, daughter's the power of attorney and she hates sister so sis, other sister goes and has an amendment drafted and signs it herself as power of attorney and the original document allowed it to happen so I do not allow for that in my powers of attorney for financial management um, but how does this affect you guys right the person holding the power of financial management be it the son daughter friend um, again they can they can sign your listing agreement. They can sell mom or grandma's home, okay? And this is how financial elder abuse plays into it because you really have to just kind of do your diligence and make sure the person you're dealing with, and sometimes, I mean, they're gonna lie, right? <laughs> they're really not gonna come in and say, hey, my mom's in a nursing home. I really hate my sister. I've hated her since I was 10. I plan on selling mom's home, taking all the cash. Like, no one is gonna come and say that to you. I just want you guys to be aware that sometimes that liability could be imparted onto you guys. So what does that look like? Um, and what are some red flags? Let's say uh, Sally Smith is on title. Uh, Sally Smith has dementia. Sally Smith is in a convalescent home in you know uh, one of the wards where they keep people who have dementia and are like a flight risk. <laughs> um, Sally Smith's caretaker comes to you right and says that their power of attorney for for Sally Smith and they want to they want to sell Sally Smith's home I really encourage you guys just in a super like non confrontational you know not offensive way just ask some questions right uh, what's Sally's current health when did she become incapacitated does she have any kids Let's look for other actors who might be affected by this transaction, okay? Who, start thinking in the mind frame, and this is horrible to have to think in, but like who would you maybe have liability towards, right? And it would be Sally Smith's heirs, right? So maybe Sally Smith's heirs live out of state, and if this caretaker starts telling you, well, you know, she has a son and a daughter, but they've never lifted a finger and they've never done anything for Sally. And, you know, they don't deserve anything. Like, no, <laughs> let's not do that, okay? Um, I had a litigation, it's still pending up in LA, and caretaker had a stamp of Sally Smith's name, okay? Please do not allow anybody to sign a listing agreement with an incapacitated person's name stamp, okay? <laughs> 
you have just bought yourself a lawsuit, okay? Do not do that, so that's not great. <laughs> um, but really, these are the kinds of scenarios that, I mean, especially when a market is turning down, if there's not a lot of listings, you know, you wanna find a way to make it work, but some of them are really just not worth it, okay? Um, financial elder abuse carries a really, it's not criminal, like nobody's gonna haul you away to jail, but um, it really does carry a heavy weight with it. You could be liable for somebody's attorney's fees, right? For the person having to get the house back's attorney's fees. Um, and uh, punitive damages, right? And let alone just damages of what these heirs might have lost um, in this sale, right? Because if you assisted with it, then Sal, you know, the caretaker sells Sally's home and then the money gets transferred you know, into Bitcoin and is gone, you know, you're, they're gonna try to find some pockets, okay? Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that uh example with the stamp yes I, I would if you have done your diligence and you're comfortable with the scenario I think I mean, that's okay um, certainly you don't have to make everything in person I know everything is done DocuSign I use DocuSign um, just just be careful just vet, vet the situation and if you're comfortable with it then that's certainly appropriate you know um, once you've maybe weeded out um, that there aren't any kids or anything else of that nature. I would, I think that's appropriate. Yeah. I have a situation where there's an elderly, one parent in the UK, one parent, one child. Uh, the parent is elderly, not doing well physically. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think has the capacity to sign. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that case when there isn't a trust and they're trying to sell the property, but he really can't sign? Absolutely. So question, somebody comes to you to sell, you know, sign a listing agreement, but maybe they're not all there cognitively, right? There's some deficits well, that you're noticing. Involved, and he's a little bit of a shady character, to be quite honest with you. But I've known them for a long time. Sure. So this is... Let me tell you, this is precisely the scenario, the first one I was talking about that got litigated because it was a realtor that got brought in as a friend of the family and thought it was okay and they ended up being sued. So what you do in that scenario where elderly person does not, maybe you're suspecting does not have capacity and then you have a son or daughter, right? That is maybe friendly with you and you kind of want to push this listing through. Get a capacity, ask for, ask for two things, say, you know, and it's it's not offensive, and I would maybe because you you have to ask yourself who's the client, right? Who's my duty towards? The owner is the father. And you right, so you have to have the father sign. That would be your client, right? But sign how? Because I, I had him sign a listing. You can't. There's nothing eligible. He can't see the point where the pen is, and he signs it. So let me tell. Those scary. are all um, great deposition answers for somebody suing for financial elder abuse <laughs> right that he couldn't see somebody had to hold his hand we had to point to him where to sign so as realtors always blame it like blame it on someone else be like i spoke with the attorney and the attorney said x or i talked with my broker or i talked with somebody or my rules of professional conduct tell me x because it, it's really true the two things you have to ask for in the scenario is if if elder wants to sign, but you meet with elder and elders like talking about purple hippos or somebody standing behind you that's not there, you ask for a letter of capacity from elder's doctor, okay? Say so if we wanna proceed at this point with elder, then we have to get a letter of capacity from the doctor. If doctor tells me that elder's good, elder's good, right? Because then you've covered yourself. Oh, you do? Okay, well, then you're good. <laughs> if doctor does not sign off, then you need something um, that says son or daughter or agent or that somebody else has authority and that's that power of attorney for financial management. Okay, so one or the other. Either you need a doctor's note or you need a power of attorney for financial management. And to your point where you're saying you already have the doctor's letter, I would just maybe go one step further and if it's for yourself, you know, and you just really wanna make sure that you're okay, if that's an old doctor's letter and maybe things have changed, like when he was maybe okay, and maybe we're now eight months out, six months out, and things are looking a little different, ask for a new one. Say you talk to an attorney, say like, I just happened to be at this talk the other day. <laughs> ask for a new one. Are there for somebody to get a POA, or is that just a simple document? The person signing the POA has to have capacity. So if elder, like I have people call me and be like, my mom's in a coma and I need power of attorney. 
That ship has sailed. <laughs> the no, person has to have capacity. The person who gets the authority over the other, for instance, the no. sun. Is there any qualification for the sun to have power? No, okay. no. As long as the elder is in control of their own faculties and can sign the power of attorney and appoint son, you're good. If you're in a scenario where the person is cannot make their own decisions anymore and no power of attorney is in place, you need a conservatorship. And at that point, that's an uglier process than probate and like a whole different lunch and learn. <laughs> what if son is a dubious character? I would say, I get question, what if son's like a little bit shady? You have to use your best judgment. And I would just say best practice, if, you, if it feels wrong in your gut, might be wrong. And if he feels a little bit shady, but there's no one, this is maybe bad, but if he's maybe a little bit shady, but there's no one being harmed, meaning there's not other siblings and he would be the beneficiary anyway. And you know, does that make sense? So he is the son, he would be the only one inheriting and he's taking care of dad. The duty is still to dad because at that point, son could go to Pachanga again and put it on black and dad's just up a creek, right? And ha can't have his care paid for at that point. So you have to look at those kinds of things, you know? And I would just say that's a personal judgment call. If situations has, have changed and now you have a letter, but you also have him talking to, you know, ghosts behind you, get a second letter. No harm in that. Thank you. Yeah. Is there kind of a time period like for that letter that if you, let's say you didn't know the person beforehand? I mean, within sure. three months or two months? Like so it would come down. So again, I do litigation. So my questions to you as the realtor would be like, here's the, the first letter you got. You got it in January. Right. When did you first hear him talking about purple elephants? Well, later on in January. Well, but then you had him sign the listing agreement in March. You know, why did you not ask for another letter? I would say it's off of the triggering event. Like whenever you had a concern, that's when you should should ask. Yeah, I would. Uh, again, how do you protect yourself if somebody is elderly but does seem fine? get the doctor's note and you don't ever want to be offensive. I, I, again, I do estate planning, right? Or even just litigation. I'm not going to have an elder assign my retainer if I have a question about it. And I think once you get, I mean, I'm not that advanced in age, but I would think that they would be not so offended by it, right? If somebody's in their 90s uh, or 80s. I've had people come to me that are in their 90s and they're, they're great, but I still ask them, you know, ask them for that doctor's note. You don't have to be like, who's the president and what day of the week is it? <laughs> and can you put the hands on the clock? You don't need to do that. And it, you know, but there's ways to do it that are not, that are not offensive. A notary there, somebody else to notarize the whole transaction. Uh, so in your guys's thing, you know, in your guys's line of work, I, listing agreements are not notarized, right? That's just a DocuSign situation. Um, I, I, w I would say that asking for a doctor's note would be the best way. But again, if there's no, I'm telling, okay, as I started out saying, these are like the worst case scenarios, okay? Sometimes it's just an elderly grandma, mom, you know, or the son or daughter is doing their best to help and they need help. And that's what our society is set up for. But just be thinking of like, is this a caretaker coming to me? Is this one sister that seems to have a lot of venom for some out of state brother? Those are kind of the red flags to look out for. Or as you were saying, like a son that maybe, maybe doesn't have the best interests at heart. Other guys saw some hands? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> So many things, so many questions. Most, most title companies these days are requiring a specific power of attorney instead of a durable. So as so to that piece of real property? Correct. Okay. Correct. I would say, oh, sorry, was that the whole question? Well, <laughs> well yeah, so what, okay. do you go back and tell them that, you know, well, we've been presented this and sometimes they come back and say it's too old and we're not gonna accept it and that's that's the specific. That's the title companies scenario um, there are probate codes that specifically say they have to rely on it and that there can be damages if the title company or the financial institution or whoever does not sure they would like an updated one but if the person's already in a coma um, you can't get one and they have to honor it so I would just say at that point get an attorney involved I've done that myself for some title companies and just been like can I can I see a manager <laughs> um, and let's talk this through and it's really it ends up being okay they just need like a certain amount of um, like hand-holding to know that they're not going to get sued <laughs> right yeah 
I think it's important to know, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if any of this comes up in your listing, your in listing appointments or talking with a client, if you hear anything about power of attorney, anything, it's the first step should be contacting a broker. I'm so, so yes. So, so I'm the broker of record for my company, and, and I just, this just happened, right? The agent came to me and said, look, the mom has is showing signs of Alzheimer's, but they got the power of attorney after she started showing signs of Alzheimer's, and so first thing, go to your broker, your broker is going to check with their counsel, right? Yeah. They're going to consult with their attorneys. Yeah. So the, that's what your broker's there for. Your broker's there to, to help advise you, to keep you out of litigation, to keep you out of liability, but always use your broker as a resource so that they can consult their attorneys, which you pay for in your, in your case. Ab absolutely. And two, you brought up a great point. Just because something was signed after an initial diagnosis, and again, having litigated a bazillion of these, it's a sliding scale, right? So if they just because they're diagnosed doesn't mean full capacity is gone they could still have some contractual capacity and it's a case-by-case -case basis so that's a, that's a great point like it's a great flag to be aware of and for sure call your broker call an attorney just call someone <laughs> pass the buck to somebody else other questions other questions I just kind of quickly want to just touch base really quick on what the actual statute is so that you guys know why this really relates to you is the financial elder abuse statute says that it's financial elder abuse if someone takes or appropriates or obtains somebody's property or look at number two assists in taking okay and that's where the realtors come in because you're assisting that agent in possibly taking somebody's real property or funds okay um, so just a, a long way again I, I know I said I was worst case scenario um, uh, this is one of my kind of case summaries here uh, that I had talked to you about. This was this name stamp. Okay, so to sum up, probate is a lengthy and stressful process. Uh, nobody wants to go through it. Communicate with your clients, give them that expectation, let them know what that timeline is, work closely with your attorneys so that everybody's on the same page and that really there are no dumb questions when it comes to everybody's liability, right? Uh, everybody expects those questions, really wants to make sure that everybody is protected. So please work with an attorney. Um, again, I'm really happy to partner with you guys. Um, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out, contact me before you go to those listing appointments if you have any questions. Again, even if I'm not the attorney involved, but happy to kind of walk you guys through and give you a refresher and uh, make sure you can speak competently to your clients and kind of get that listing.